So I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. I'm Kim Seal, the Executive Director for Grades of Green, and I'm just so excited to get cooking with all of you. And I'm um, really just thank you for all of your support. Um, Grades of Green empowers students to care for the environment and develop life-changing skills to become the innovative, confident, and passionate environmental leaders of tomorrow. We truly believe that students have the power to change the world. And with the right tools, resources, and mentorship, the positive impact they can have in creating a healthier planet is limitless. This year, we decided to create our most innovative program to help our students tackle the greatest challenge of our time. No, it's not COVID, it's the climate crisis. Our new Climate Solutions Campaign allows our students to dive deep into five areas that have the greatest effect on our climate. These five areas are transportation, energy, waste, trees, and one of the reasons you're all on this call is food. They design a project and a solution with their grades of green advisors around one of these five topics that they're the most passionate about. And after putting their act plans into action, these students will have made meaningful and long lasting environmental change in their community and ours. And we get to reward the most impact impactful projects with eco grants of up to $1,000 for students to expand their projects. We are so inspired by all these young people who care deeply about the environment and have decided to take action to counter the climate crisis. Your participation tonight directly supports these student-led projects that lead to a cleaner and greener community. I'd love to share every student project with you, but I'm getting hungry. So here's just a small taste of just a few projects going on this year. Sam Torres, a longtime Grades of Greener, is leading a team of 40 students from Maricosta in our very own Manhattan Beach. And they're creating and implementing an Instagram-based Meatless Monday challenge to encourage their peers to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by being more plant-based. You'll hear a little bit more from her in a few minutes. She's truly a rock star. The Healthy Kings and Queens team out of Long Beach are developing a What's Cooking in Long Beach website featuring, featuring all vegetarian recipes submitted by Long Beach locals. And out of Nairobi, Kenya, a team of eight students are transforming trash dumping sites into lush kale gardens and planting trees. Talk about turning trash into treasures. They are amazing. I am in awe of these students and their dedication to making real change every day. And thanks to your support, they can continue changing the world one project at a time. And now we're gonna have a little fun. Pages, our local bookstore in Manhattan Beach donated Pamela's cookbooks. She has two cookbooks and the first cookbook, Kitchen Matters, is on the table right now for one of you lucky sous chefs to take home. So it's gonna be really easy. I'm going to have you go to your chat and then I'm going to ask a question and you're going to type in the answer. I'm going to give you a hint. It's a number, so it's really easy. You're going to type in one number. Whoever types the number in first, Katie has a lookout for that person, is going to get uh, Pamela's first cookbook and it will be signed. So you are so lucky. So here we go. Hopefully everyone's in their chat. Are you ready? So the question is, how many topics do our students learn about that are most affecting our climate? Go ahead, type it in. Katie's gonna let us know who the winner is. We have a winner. It looks like Lori and Madison Nolte. Um, congratulations. We will be following up with you to get your signed copy of Quicker Than Quick. Congratulations. Actually, well, you can have Quicker Than Quick too. <laughs> You'll have a oh, of, um, kitchen matters. <laughs> we'll get you quicker than quick too. We, we, we're happy to get you that. But congratulations. That's right. You were listening. Five topics. And um, yes, food is one of them. So thanks so much for playing and congratulations. And now I want to introduce you to Chrissy Clay. She's our incredible board chair who not only talks the talk, but truly walks the environmental walk. So here you go. Take it away, Chrissy. Thanks, Kim. Um, welcome everyone uh, and thank you all for being here. It's nice. I see a lot of longtime supporters here um, as well as many of you who are new to Grades of Green. Welcome everybody. 
We're so grateful that you're here. Um, like so many nonprofits, we had to cancel our annual fundraising gala this past spring, Bert, and we rely on that usually for about a third of our budget. And so after a lot of brainstorming on how we can continue to engage our supporters and raise some much needed funds, um, we came up with this idea of instead of one big in-person event, we would hold a number of smaller targeted virtual events like the one we're having tonight. Um, so that we can continue to support our grades of green students who are working to protect the planet. Um, as Kim said, food is one of the five campaign topics in our climate solutions campaign, and it's one of our most popular ones. Um, <clears throat> all across the globe, um, we have nearly 100 grades of green students and teams tackling food-related environmental challenges. So these students are fighting food waste. Um, they're setting up composting programs in their schools and in their communities. They're breaking ground on community gardens um, and they're advocating for their families and their classmates in their communities to eat less meat. The work these kids are doing is one of the reasons that we are so excited to be working with Pamela tonight because sustainable food is central to her food, her cooking and her philosophy. Uh, her recipes are not only healthy for you, they're healthy for our planet. And we're so excited to learn from her this evening. I think I've actually been taking cooking classes with Pamela about as long as I've been involved with Grades of Green, which is nine years. Um, I love learning from Pamela because not only is the food that she teaches you to make delicious, the recipes are manageable, and she has such a wealth of knowledge about food and nutrition and gadgets and, and health. And she just shares all of that information freely. For those of you who don't yet know Pamela, she's a Los Angeles-based natural foods cooking instructor. She's a holistic health counselor. And she's the author of two marvelous cookbooks, which I rely on 90% of the time, Kitchen Matters, which came out in 2017, and then Quicker Than Quick, which came out earlier this year. Um, she teaches in person in private homes when we're not having COVID. Um, and she also teaches through an online platform with hundreds of monthly subscribers. She's been on the Today Show, she's been on the Rachel Ray Show, and she's been on dozens of local news shows around here. She's been featured in print publications like Real Simple, um, Allure, LC Magazine, as well as on websites like Goop, um, Well and Good, and Chalkboard Mag. So as you can see, she's the real deal. And I know that you all will find her as engaging and informative and fun as I do. So Pamela, again, thank you for doing this for Grades of Green. And to all of you who are here, thank you for being here and supporting our work. In fact, while we're waiting for Pamela to get started, some of our students have a short message that they'd like to share with you. Hi, I'm Sam Torres. I'm Vivica Henry. I'm Isaiah Williams. Hi, I'm Riley Goldfarb. I've been with Grades Green for about nine or 10 years now. It's very much impacted my life. So before I joined, I didn't realize how much power one person actually had or like even one family has on helping the environment. I'm someone who loves to, you know, get involved, be part of that action. And that gives me that like drive and that passion for the environment. That's what essentially I think of when I think of Grades of Green. Basically all my leadership can be like attributed to Grades of Green because They've given me like such a good platform to be able to do that. The programs that Grades of Green does are very organized, but they're also very student led. So our advisors are really there to be our support system and just make sure like students are able to lead and have their voices heard. Well, I think even though you have like a passion and that desire to make a change in the environment, the one thing you need is to have that voice, to have that ability to speak out and discuss these environmental issues. Learning to use your voice is really important because even if we don't consider a young person's voice to be as important now, they're going to eventually get older and they're going to need to use their voice. And I think it's even better if they're learning at such a young age to be actual, you know, forces in their community and be advocates for themselves and for the environment. That's really powerful um, to be able to do at a young age. And I think that's a beautiful thing that Grades of Green um, has been able to cultivate in our in their students. Thank you for supporting Grades of Green. Because of you, I can teach people how to reduce their carbon footprint. Because of you, I can protect our oceans from plastic pollution. Because of you, I can plant trees to combat climate change. Because of you, 
I can advocate for a zero waste future. Because of you, I can help conserve precious natural resources. Because of you, I can advocate for a cooler planet. Because of you, I can help my community lower its carbon footprint. Thank, Thank you for supporting Raising Green. Green. Hi everyone, uh, my name is James Saracini. I'm the Marketing Communications Director at Grades of Green. Before we begin and, and we get to the, to the part we're all waiting for, uh, I had a few Zoom instructions for you. To make sure that you see all of the action, please switch over to the speaker view in Zoom. You should be able to see the button for this after moving your mouse over the top right corner of the Zoom application. The button may say something like gallery view, speaker view, or just view. You can click that now and click speaker view and it'll make the screen bigger. Uh, if you have it set up already, you'll see my face um, pretty big on your screen. Okay, so at the end of the class, if time allows, Pamela will have time to share um, and to talk about some of your questions. So please type them directly into the chat and we'll pull them from there. Now it's time to start cooking. Welcome to Pamela's Kitchen. Hi, am I up? <laughs> good to go <laughs> okay awesome hi you guys thank you so much for joining me tonight i am so first of all i'm so happy to see so many faces that i know but so many new faces as well and i have been a big supporter of grades of green since its inception honestly and the message of Grades of Green is very much in sync with the message that I've been trying to infuse into my cooking classes all these years, it, which is that the food choices that you make have a big impact, not only on your health, but on the planet as well. So this is something that I feel like a lot of adults may or may not know, but the fact that we are also trying to get this message to our children at a very early age is going to impact them and obviously impact us later on because we are going to be helping to develop healthy and sustainable habits for them. So without further ado, let's get cooking. Um, we selected this recipe tonight. We're going to start obviously with the chicken. We selected this recipe tonight because it's easy. It's family friendly. It's very adaptable. I know some of you um, are interested in making things without any uh, animal protein, which is great. I mix it up a lot as well. But um, I can give you some other tweaks along the, the way. You should have prepped everything already, but I did want to show you just one little tip, which is just how to chop an onion efficiently. So I'm going to have the camera just come over to me a little bit closer. So this is how you hold a knife properly, is you take your bottom three fingers and you're going to grip your handle with the bottom three fingers. And then these two fingers are going to pinch the base of your blade. This is just a classic chef's knife. Any size will do, whether it's six inches or 10 inches or eight inches, doesn't matter. But this is the proper grip. It might feel weird to start, but when you, when you get used to it, you'll see that the knife then just becomes an extension of your wrist. So we're gonna cut this onion through the core, that's important to try and keep the core intact because this is what's gonna hold all the layers of the onion together. And then what you're gonna do is put the onion cut side down. I'm a righty, so I'm gonna hold the knife in my right hand. The core is gonna be on the left side and I'm gonna put a little bit of pressure on the onion and then hopefully you have a sharp knife. You're gonna cut the onion parallel to the cutting board without actually cutting all the way through. So you're going to kind of end up around there. And the more cuts you make, the smaller the pieces are. And then you're going to go kind of with the lines of the onion. But again, you're not cutting all the way through that core. You'll cut down to the cutting board, but you still basically want this onion to stay intact. And then you're going to cut crosswise across. And you should be able to do this 
pretty quickly without having to chase onion all over the cutting board. And then with the end piece, I am also a big proponent of not wasting food. We are gonna use this little end piece. We'll just cut it one way and then chop it the other way. Okay, so let's do this in real time because most people don't talk to themselves while they're cutting onions. So we're gonna do that one more time. Again, not cutting all the way through like that, the long way. And if you have trouble with onions in terms of crying, then you can just put a really large candle on your cutting board, or you can bring your cutting board close to a flame, like a gas burner, and keep that on high, but just make sure your cutting board isn't too close to the flame. And then the, the flame will burn the gases from the onion and you won't cry, I promise. All right, one last thing that I'm gonna do is just show you how to chop some garlic. And the best way to do this, if you're just chopping it, is just to kind of smash it lightly like that. And this prevents it from rolling all over the cutting board like that. And then you're gonna do this like a rocking motion with your knife like that. And it should be easy to chop. There we go. Okay, perfect. So the last thing we're gonna do before we actually get going with the recipe is to make sure you've added salt to your seasonings for the chicken. So I'm just gonna mix some salt in here and the same thing goes for pepper. So if you haven't done that, the recipe calls for two teaspoons of salt, but it calls for it to be what's called divided. So divided means that you're gonna use some of the salt at one point in the recipe and some of the salt at another point in the recipe. So in this case, you're gonna add one teaspoon of salt to your chicken seasoning and the other teaspoon is gonna get added in a little bit. I have a 10 inch skillet back here and I like this one because it has straight sides and therefore I can cover it with a lid. Okay, if you have too large of a skillet for this recipe, what could end up happening is your rice could get a little bit hard because your water is going to evaporate too quickly. So it's best if you can try to approximate 10 inches as close to this as possible. So let's start warming up our skillet. We are going to preheat it. Now, you're only gonna preheat your skillet if you have all of your ingredients prepped and ready to go. This recipe kind of moves quickly once you get started. So let's start by taking our seasoning. Hopefully you have your chicken chopped up and you're going to season your chicken like this. Now, it is my understanding that chicken has much less of an environmental footprint as beef. And if you're gonna even go veggie with this recipe and use beans, then you're even doing much better <laughs> than the rest of us. But even going meatless like one night a week is a good start to help the environment. Meatless Monday, right? Okay, so if your chicken is all nice and coated, perfect, then we can get started. If you need to prep some of these things in advance, like if you wanna get home at the end of the night and like just start cooking and have this on the table really fast, you could do this step and just cover it and keep it in the fridge even overnight with the seasoning on it. And actually it tastes even better. So let's head over to the stove. And you can use any kind of oil you want, either olive oil or avocado oil, either one. I'm just gonna guesstimate the amount here. You just need a light coating. And if you really liked meat and this wasn't enough for you, because we don't really eat that much animal protein, um, you could end up doing one and a half times the chicken and then you would multiply all of your spices times one and a half and then just do this in batches. You could do that as well. So when your oil starts to ripple, but not smoke, then you start adding your chicken pieces. And this is going to create a lot of flavor by getting them browned in advance. So hopefully, I don't know if everybody's cooking along or if you're just watching, but this is the time that we're gonna start hype here. <laughs> we're gonna start adding our chicken pieces to the skillet. And you wanna make sure that you have a nice sizzle. There we go. 
And you can also adapt this recipe. If you decide you really like it and you find this to be very easy, you can do other spices and just mix it up. So if you guys have my book, Quicker Than Quick, you might notice a recipe that feels very similar to this in terms of the method, which is the um, weeknight arroz con pollo. It's the same formula, just with slightly different tweaks on the flavor profile and some of the added ingredients. All right, so go in here. And then any other dried spices that didn't get accumulated, just take that last piece of chicken and do that. Now, this recipe was designed to accommodate a certain amount of chicken in one layer. Okay, and that's what we want. We can bring this back here. And that's what we want. You want the chicken to be in one layer because if, you, if it's on top of each other, if it's all squished together, then it's gonna start steaming and poaching. And you're never gonna get that really wonderful caramelization, that browning that you're gonna see on the bottom. So we're gonna let this go for a minute. And then I'm gonna check it and then we're gonna flip it over and we don't have to brown it on like six sides. You know, just two sides is fine. Just enough to create that flavor. Now, I know that Katie is going to be asking me any questions that come up. So if anything comes up, Katie, um, at this point, feel free to jump in. Otherwise, I'll point out a couple of other ingredients that I got uh, a head start on. So I already diced up my tomato. I have used cherry tomatoes in this recipe. I have used glass jarred um, tomatoes that have been drained, use that. I really don't believe that you can't find a substitution for something. And especially now where a lot of us really don't want to be making unnecessary trips out, it's there's always a way to find something to swap for an ingredient that you either may not have or may not like. Okay, let's go check on this chicken. So the point of this, again, is to create flavor. So hopefully your chicken is starting to look like that and just turn it over. The point is not to cook the chicken through. We're gonna do that once we get our rice in here, and then the chicken will cook through. If you cook the chicken through now, and then put it on top of the rice, it's gonna get dried out. There. And I might add a little extra oil, so it's a bit dry. Okay, that looks good. These are looking mighty, mighty golden. So, smell like pretty? You guys, is your chicken looking like that? Perfect. Pam, we've got a couple questions. Wow. I know we have a couple questions here for you. Sure. Okay, so Linda Rosen is asking, when you describe what to do with the chicken, can you also mention what to do differently if we are using chickpeas? Yes. So I think that it was on the bottom of the recipe that was sent out to you guys, I think. Um, but what you would do is instead of starting with the chicken and spices, you'll take the same spices and you'll um, put them in after you've got the um, onion sauteed. Okay, so you'll add your spices at that point to kind of toast them up to get some aroma out of them. And then you'll proceed with the recipe as it's written. And then you'll add your canned chickpeas drained and rinsed. You'll just throw them on top of the rice when you add your rice and then cook as normal. So it's a pretty easy swap. Great, thank you. Um, Anjali is asking, Maya, age four and a half, wants to know what your specialty or favorite thing to make is. Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I don't have like a specialty in terms of like type of like entree, salad, soup or whatever. I really like to make everything, but I will say that my, my favorite kind of food is just more 
plant focused. So more vegetarian style, definitely, definitely seasonal ingredients. So that's really the kind of food that I like. I really like sourcing locally grown food, you know, things that are at the farmer's market. Um, but I will say I do like baking pies as well. Great, thank you. And sure. let's get one more question in before. So sure. Ellen Rosenberg is asking, can you share the estimated amount of onion in cups? The one that I received was really large and I think it may be more than needed. Okay, so I would say probably like three quarters of a cup would be fine. That works. Okay, so let's now take our chicken out. So hopefully you have some good color on your chicken. You don't need to overdo it. And this is kind of how you start a stew as well. You brown your protein, you pull it out, and then you get started on your aromatics and then you put the chicken back in. Now you can see I'm putting it into the same bowl that I had originally tossed it in. So why would we do that? It, it was in, you know, it was raw. And so you're gonna put it back in the bowl where it was raw. Well, we still have to cook this. So why wash another dish? <laughs> That's what I say. All right, so into the skillet, I mean, I again, didn't really guesstimate my um, oil probably correctly. So I added another little teaspoon. And now we're gonna add our onion in here like that, we should still have a good sizzle. And we want to saute the onion until it's tender and translucent. This is a key step because we're trying to create flavor and your visual cue for knowing that you're ready to move on to the next step is tender and translucent onions. So if you just throw your onions in there and then throw your rice on top and then put your stock in. Your onions are never gonna develop that like beautiful like sweetness, right? That we're developing right now. So just take your time, but this should come together probably in about, I don't know, like four or even five minutes. So we'll let this saute. And then anything that's stuck to the bottom of your pan is flavor from the chicken. And we're going to end up deglazing that once we get our tomato in here. So you can try and scrape a little bit off just so it doesn't burn, but don't worry. You are not gonna have a dirty pan at the end of this. It will not be hard to clean because we're gonna clean it off when we deglaze. So in the meantime, let me get my other ingredients ready. So it looks like uh, after that, I'm gonna add my garlic and you're gonna add more salt with the garlic. The reason that I'm not adding the garlic right now is because if I put chopped garlic in that skillet, it would burn before the onion would be tender and translucent. So if you're never sure like, wait, should I put my garlic in with the onion or should I put my garlic in after the onion? It really depends on kind of how much stuff is in the skillet or like if you're making a soup is in the pot. So if I'm making a soup and I have an onion and two carrots and two things of celery and I wanna add some garlic, there's plenty of other stuff in there that's taking up all of the surface area of your pan or your, your pot so that the garlic won't have its own space to burn, if that makes sense, okay. So as soon as our onion is good, we're gonna add in our garlic. We're gonna cook that just until it's fragrant. It's just gonna take like a minute. Then we're gonna add our tomatoes and then we're gonna scrape that. And then all you do is you add your rice, your olives, chicken stock, and put your chicken on top, You know, bring it to a simmer and then you're good to go. I mean, really, this is a very, very easy, straightforward recipe. Now, one of the questions that I get most often in cooking classes is about substitutions, like the what if. What if I don't like olives? Well, leave them out. <laughs> you know, what if I don't have, you know, uh, a chicken stock? Okay, so make it with water or make it with vegetable stock. Something that I want to just mention is that the recipe calls for two cups of chicken stock. And we, I think we all got the same chicken stock. This was just shy of two cups. I didn't even bother opening up the second one. I just added water 
to this to make this go up to two cups, all right? If you have the second one opened and now you have some chicken stock and you don't know what you're gonna do with it, it'll last for a good three or four days in your fridge or you can just freeze it. You can freeze it in ice cube trays, but don't waste it. Chicken stock is like gold. Okay, so yeah, that looks great. All right, so let's add in our garlic. How's your onions, you guys? Looking good? Looking tender? Translucent? It'll probably have a little bit of a golden edge on it from the spices that were in there. So once you add in your garlic, you are committed. You are committed to this recipe. There is no turning back. Okay, that garlic is gonna be fragrant in 30 to 60 seconds. So your tomatoes best be chopped. <laughs> I don't know about you, but sometimes I, I have to admit, I do chop as I go through recipes, but the faster the recipe, the less you wanna do that. You really wanna have everything like kind of get going. Okay, tomato time. So remember I said before, we're gonna deglaze that pan. We're gonna clean it up. You do that with acid. So whether it's wine or citrus, or in this case, tomatoes, acid is gonna help like pull all those flavor bits that are stuck on your pan. So if you guys are ready, I'm ready. We're gonna add our tomatoes. Any juice that was in the tomatoes, go ahead and make sure that goes in there too. And now take your spoon, or if you have something like a wooden turner, these are great. Just start cleaning the pan, okay? Scrape, scrape, scrape. Here we go. And when it looks nice and clean, then we add everything else in. How's everybody doing? Thumbs up? Yeah? I love it. Smells good, right? Yes, yeah, smells good. Okay. Uh, you may want to, did everybody check how the quantity of their rice? Yeah? Hopefully it was exactly what you need. Rice can be a little bit sensitive to measurements of like liquid. So hopefully it's uh, exactly what we, you need. So let's put in our rice. You cannot swap brown rice in this recipe unless you make an adjustment with your chicken because brown rice will take about 40, 50, maybe even 55 minutes. If you let your chicken cook for that length of time, it will be completely dried out. So you can leave your chicken off to the side if you wanted to use brown rice and then allow your brown rice to cook for 30 minutes. And then you can tuck your chicken in real fast, cover it again and let it continue to cook, okay? So rice is in. And honestly, like I made this up, okay? I, if who's been to like anywhere in the Mediterranean and had anything like this, it's it's because I made it up. I made it up. I made up the name. I just use Mediterranean ingredients, so that's why I called it that. But honestly, you know, if you don't like olives, you don't have to add olives. You could add capers. You could add like sun-dried tomatoes in here. You could. I like them because they're kind of salty and briny, and I happen to like that flavor. But if you wanted to add like frozen defrosted artichoke hearts you could throw those in there really there's a lot of things that i think could be kind of fun all right so let's take out our olives toss those in there too delicious add our chicken stock or if you're vegetarian vegetable stock or water i'm going to give this a stir to make sure everything is submerged. And let's bring this up to high heat. Let's get this going. Okay, but don't stir your rice continuously. Like don't agitate it because what's gonna happen is you're gonna release too much starch from your rice. So just stir it so that it's nice and submerged, but you don't wanna just continue to stir it. This is not risotto, so let's not make the starch release. Let's bring this up to a simmer. I am now going to put the chicken right on top. You don't need to submerge it 
just lay it right on top because the chicken just wants, you just want to like cook it gently so that it doesn't get dry. So just like that, plunk, like this. If you're doing it with chickpeas, you add your chickpeas right on top. If you don't have chickpeas, white beans would be great. Like that, and any juice that's from the chicken that's still in your reserve bowl here, you're gonna add that too, because that has flavor. And then we're going to cover this as soon as you see that it's at a simmer. So if you guys have any reserve juice in your bowl, just dump that in. Okay, so this is starting to come to a simmer for me. I don't know about for you guys. How are we doing? Everybody up to speed? Yeah, awesome. All right, so I see this coming to a simmer. I'm gonna cover this and I'm gonna lower this all the way down to the lowest setting. Time for my timer. Got a timer. We're gonna time this for 20 minutes. There you go. I'm gonna tell you something also. This dish reheats so well. Okay, so let's talk about not wasting food. This dish reheats so well, it freezes beautifully. So after it's cooked, obviously, we're not gonna freeze uncooked rice, but after it's cooked, cooled, whatever, if you don't feel like, like you're going on vacation or whatever, and you don't feel like you're gonna eat it, throw it into the freezer and it will freeze beautifully. Also something that you can do with leftovers for a dish like this, is let's just say you have some leftovers, but it's not quite enough to feed your family. Something that you can do is shred the chicken or chop it up, throw it into a saucepan, and then add some chicken stock enough that it will make a soupy consistency. And then you've got a soup and you, haven't, you don't have to do anything to it. If you have some extra vegetables lying around, like some spinach leaves or kale or something like that, you could definitely add and supplement. But something like this, because I've, I've made this into a soup, you've already done all the work, right? You've sauteed the onion, you've toasted your spices, your chicken is done, makes a soup. Okay, before I move on to salad, what do you have, Katie? All right, we have some great questions here. Uh, a nun, another one about um, swapping ingredients. What could, what could our guests swap for the tomato? So the tomato just adds a little bit of acidity. Okay, so you, you want to think to yourself, okay, you know, a lot of recipes have that balance and uh, of flavors and acidity is, is something that gives a recipe balance. If you don't like tomatoes, you know, obviously you can totally leave them out. Something that does have a little bit of acidity is something like a, and I don't know if you just want to omit tomatoes all together, but something else that you could add would be either a roasted red pepper, something that you can buy already roasted and you can just chop those up. You're not going to necessarily be able to deglaze with that, but it can give you like a kind of a, an acidic flavor, some of the roasted peppers, or you could even just chop in a bell pepper, uh, a sweet bell pepper for color, and that would be very pretty. Great, thank you, that's very helpful. Um, we have another question, can you tell us about the spice za'atar? We have it. Oh, yeah. You can do this entire dish with za'atar if you want to. Obviously, you know, check your za'atar to see if it has salt already added, but za'atar is, I call it the Middle Eastern uh, herbs de Provence. Okay, so it's a spice blend. It's not one single herb and it's different in different regions. So you might get a za'atar from like, I don't know, like Israel that's different from one that's in a different country or like wh whatever. But a lot of times it has either dried thyme or an herb called hyssop. Um, sometimes it has sumac, it has sesame seeds. And again, sometimes it has salt already added and it's very, very like herbaceous. I really like it. Um, the ones that have sumac and sumac is this 
kind of citrusy berry and it's a little bit tart and it's red. I happen to love sumac. I don't necessarily prefer my za'atar with sumac, but you can find za'atar at uh, like Middle Eastern markets, but you can also find it on like thrivemarket.com. You can find it on Amazon there. It's really delicious. I love it on hummus and I love it if I make my own pita chips. I love it on pita. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see. Kim Jones asks, are the wooden spoon, are wooden spoons the best utensils to use when cooking or would you recommend something else? Well, when you're sauteing, you don't want to use stainless steel because then you're going to scratch your pan. I mean, I do use stainless steel tongs and I do like a stainless steel spatula for like flipping pancakes or burgers or something, but I otherwise only use um, wooden utensils, bamboo, or I use silicone. So I don't use plastic because plastic just tends to melt and it doesn't last very long. And when plastics are heated, they can leach into your food. I mean, it's not a big deal once or twice, but it's not something you want to do regularly. So silicone, as far as I can tell from what I've researched, is inert. It's easy to clean. It doesn't leach. Um, and I feel like 99.9% .9 of utensils are going to be made with food grade silicone. So that's what I would say. Right. Um, Michelle and Shelby had a two part question. What temperature should the onions be on? I think previously when you're sauteing and what is the difference between minced and chopped? Oh, great question. So um, you're going to be sauteing over medium heat. I will say because I've worked in so many different home kitchens and tested out so many different ranges, sometimes other people's mediums aren't the same as like my medium or your medium. So, you know, you just don't want to be burning anything, but you want some activity to be happening. So, you know, maybe you have to go just under medium. You, you, sometimes you have to be a little bit more in touch with what's happening as opposed to just relying on that specific recipe. As far as minced and chopped, minced is very, very, very small. Like I rarely use like minced onion unless it's like um, in like a turkey burger or something. And in that case, I would just throw it into the food processor and like pulse it up that way. But minced is like, it's really like as, as small as you can get in a way. Chopped is, it's slightly bigger than diced. <laughs> so diced is about the size of a, a pea and chopped is a little bit bigger than that. That's a super helpful reference. Um, we have a couple questions about the upcoming salad dressing. Yeah. Um, what can you, um, from Jessica, what can you substitute for unseasoned rice vinegar in the dressing? Um, it, yeah, let's start that one. Yeah, great question. Okay. so. This, like, obviously I'm not a huge fan of too many processed um, foods and all of that. I think, you know, for many reasons, I mean, not just because processed foods have a big environmental impact over, you know, more fresh stuff, but, oh, but also because I think that a lot of times, you know, we can make things that are obviously healthier. This salad dressing I created about 20 years ago for my mother-in-law who was buying um, this boxed salad dressing. It was like in a packet and you would open it up and you would pour this like seasoning packet which had like so much sugar in it. I could not even believe it into a jar. And then you would like add the water and the oil and vinegar and mix it up and whatever. And I'm like, okay, we have to stop this. So I created this salad dressing specifically for her and it became my family's favorite. I make it minimum once a week, but very often twice a week. And I've been doing that for like 20 years. I love all my salads, but this is just the one that I go to all the time because it goes with everything. I call it my everyday salad dressing number two. Really should be called number one, but I, I, I really wasn't thinking the day that I named my salad dressings. So with this salad dressing, I really like the combination of the apple cider vinegar and the rice vinegar. I think it just makes it taste it more interesting and more balanced. If you don't have rice vinegar, you can swap in a white wine vinegar or a lemon juice if you want to, a fresh lemon juice, not bottled, a fresh lemon juice. It won't taste exactly the same, but it will still taste 
great. And by the way, unseasoned rice vinegar is just rice vinegar that's not seasoned. So this one does not say unseasoned on it. It just doesn't have sugar or salt added. And ones that are seasoned will say seasoned. And those are primarily used for like sushi rice, like if you're making sushi rice. I just happen to like rice vinegar a lot because I think it has like a very, just like light and zingy flavor to it. Um, so if you want, Katie, we can, we can start on our salad dressing. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So let's, let's just trim this shallot a little bit. Uh, I very often will get a question about shallots. Like, how do you know what one like, you know, medium shallot is, et cetera, is, you know, sometimes you open them up and they've got two different cloves in it. In this case, the recipe calls for a certain amount, you know, uh, finely chopped or whatever, but if the cloves are together, that's considered one shallot, not each clove. So let me just take off this papery thin stuff. If you don't have shallot, don't worry about it. But I love it. I love it in dressing. I think it's delicious. So the same thing goes for mincing your shallot as for the onion. It just can be a little bit harder because it's smaller. So let's make the same cuts not going through the root end. You wanna go as many times as you can because we're trying to get this nice and small. If you don't mince it, who cares? Finally chop it, it's gonna be great. If you can't finally chop it because your knife skills aren't there, then dice it. Half the time I'm so lazy, I don't even bother. I just like do whatever I want and it's still fantastic. Nobody's ever asked for their money back. So we're now going to go the long way. Remember, same as the onion, like this. Get that little piece of paper out of the way. And then go across. Okay. And then we're gonna do the same thing with that little root end. Another thing you guys can do, by the way, is you can take little scraps like this and carrot peels and washed leek tops and parsley stems and butternut squash peels. And uh, I'm trying to think what up, celery bottoms, all those things I stick in a bag in the freezer. And when I'm ready to make vegetable stock, I put them into a soup pot, I cover them with water and I made vegetable stock for free. So you, there are a lot of ingredients. And now if you wanna get this smaller, just run your knife across it. There's a lot of ingredients that you can use for vegetable stock. I swear, I don't think I've ever bought, I haven't bought vegetables for vegetable stock in so long. I just use the whatever's in my freezer from my scraps. Okay, so just run your knife across this a bunch of times. And if you wanna measure out two teaspoons, you can. I'm not going to, I'm just gonna use everything that's on my, on my board. And I love shallots, I use them. Anytime like there's a recipe that calls for a very annoyingly small amount of onion, like guacamole or tuna salad, I always just substitute shallot. All right, so I'm gonna stick all of this in here, even though it's not two teaspoons, because I like shallot. And now we're gonna add in our acid. The recipe doesn't say, this is apple cider vinegar. The recipe doesn't say to, um, uh, like leave it onto your, your um, shallot and just let it marinate, but it does kind of bring out more flavor from your shallot if you just let it sit there for a bit. Okay, so two tablespoons. This, this makes quite a bit of salad dressing. Do not think that you're gonna use all this salad dressing tonight. You're gonna have this for several salads. Never like dump all the salad dressing on a salad. Even if the recipe says that it's for the salad, you always wanna just, underestimate because especially if you have very tender greens like I think the ones that I have tonight are like kind of baby greens these get soggy very quickly and different lettuces take on different amounts of dressing so just you know kind of ease into it all right so we have that then we're gonna use oh my gosh this is so cute does everybody have this like a little squeeze of gray poupon how cute is this? I love it. So let's cut open our mustard. This is so fun. We're all squeezing little tubes of Grey Poupon at the same time. 
I mean, I have never had so much fun on a Wednesday night, you guys, as I am right now, squeezing little tubes of Brie Poupon with like a hundred of you. This is fantastic. Okay, this is great. All right, now, oh my gosh, it's even getting better. Now we have a little thing of honey. How good is this? <laughs> honey, maple syrup, whatever. I'm just gonna add a dash. Little secret about me is I don't love the taste of honey, but it's a great sweetener. I just, it's not my favorite in terms of flavor. So if we're ever on a game show together and they say like, what's the sweetener that Pamela doesn't really like the flavor of? The correct answer is honey. <laughs> okay, so get your pepper in there. Let's guesstimate that. And then our salt. Voila. And then add your olive oil. We don't need to emulsify this, don't worry. We're gonna shake this up. And you've got a fantastic salad dressing. So let's taste it. How are we gonna taste it? Well, you could taste it with a spoon, but that's not how I taste my salad dressings. I'm gonna taste it with a little bit of salad greens because that's how you would eat it. So that's how you're gonna know if you forgot the salt or you forgot the honey or something like that. So just dip a little in there. So good, so good. So I do need more honey. I was being very, very cheap with the honey because you know, but I need it. All right, lovely. Great. Now we're not going to add our salad right now because we don't want to dress salad until just before we're about to eat, right? So what we can do is we can cut some apple. We can, um, oh, we got some walnuts too. This is fantastic. The walnuts are already in a bag. So let's do this. Let's save ourselves some trouble and let's just smash them like this. Or we can, let's hold on. I think I have a meat mallet. Mm, yeah. You have something like this. This is great. If you have a rolling pin, like this. That's so much easier. There, done. Our walnuts are done. Love it. If you don't like walnuts or if you're nut free, you know, the walnuts are just there for a little crunch. So you can add other things. I mean, it doesn't even have to be a nut or a seed. You could add something like red cabbage, which is one of my favorite salad ingredients. You could do thinly sliced radishes or julienned radishes. That offers really nice crunch or, you know, whatever you want. It's not really the season for, you know, cucumber. So I wouldn't add that right now. But anything, you know, in the cabbage family is in season right now. So we're gonna add that to our salad. You know, we can cut our apple. It might oxidize slightly, but that's okay. So let's slice off the opposite cheeks of the apple like that. And then we can slice off this side too. And this one. So then, you know, it depends on how you wanna cut this. I personally don't love ingredients that are not a bite. So I don't want to eat like huge slices of apple because then I'm gonna have to cut them up. I would rather that they be julienne or if you wanna do something like, you can cut it into slices like this. And then you can take those slices and then, you know, cut them into like thinner sort of triangles like that or you can slice and then you can make like little sticks. Either way, it's not really important. Um, but if you like a big chunk of apple, you can dice it up. So we can cut this, like so you can stack your slices and then you can make these little sticks as well. That's fun. All right, so it looks like we have like a minute and a 45 and counting for our chicken. All right, we are going to have to like check to make sure all of the water is absorbed. And then if it is, we're going to leave it off the heat covered for another few minutes just to like fluff it up a little bit. 
So um, let me know, Katie, if you have any other questions that are just burning. Thank you, Pamela. Um, so we have a, another question from Rob. What is the best chopping method for cutting veggies? It depends on the vegetable. So, you know, you, you should still employ the same uh, grip for your knife, which is like this. And it, it really, it depends. So if you are slicing, for example, a bell pepper, something that I would advise would be once you have your bell pepper off of the stem and the seeds is that you would slice that on the inside of the pepper because sometimes people's knives aren't sharp enough and if you're slicing on the skin of the pepper it can slip and you could hurt yourself so that's just a special technique just for peppers if you're cutting something like celery you know i like to cut the celery in strips and then go the opposite direction but there's a different really different techniques for different vegetables and i mean carrots for example like you could be cutting carrots into big chunks. You could be dicing them for a soup. You could be slicing them for a salad. I mean, I, I, there's really no one answer for that. Great. Um, another question we have um, for the salad part, uh, do, do our guests need to rinse the greens before, um, before assembling the salad? like the ones in the ingredient bag? Oh, well, that's a good question. I don't know, because I don't know where they're from, um, if they were pre-washed. So it depends on where they were sourced from. And that is not a question for me. <laughs> okay. is, I'm sorry, this is an important question, but yes, please wash your greens. Um, they, they were sourced fairly locally, but you need to wash green. Well, I believe you wash greens at all times. That's my personal. Sorry, I'm just jumping in on you, Pam. Oh, thank you. Yeah, good to know. I would say wash your greens because that's what I believe. Okay. I will say though, if they, if they say pre-washed, I usually don't wash them again. So I have, knock on wood, never had an issue ever. So I've talked to different um, vendors about, you know, do you really wash them? Like, do you really? And they're like, we really do. We have a lot to lose if we said that we wash them and we didn't. So, but on the other hand, you know, a lot of foodborne illnesses come from um, vegetables that haven't been washed, so. Got it. <laughs> um, if our guests don't have walnuts, what is a good replacement? You know, um, it, it doesn't have to be a nut. I mean, I feel like the ingredients that are for the salad are just seasonal and arbitrary, really. So the walnuts are really there just for a little bit of crunch factor. And um, this question probably came after I had already talked about it, but um, something like pumpkin seeds, are great if you toast them up. Sesame, uh, sunflower seeds are really nice for crunch. I've even fried up some cooked quinoa and used that on top. I mean, some people like croutons, but you know, that's, you know, it's totally an option. Um, even something, like I said before, red cabbage chopped up um, is really nice in terms of like crunch and it really makes for a pretty salad as well. So you guys should look at your chicken. I don't have any liquid in the bottom of my skillet. So I just stuck a spoon down there and kind of moved it over. There's no liquid in my skillet. So I'm turning this off and I'm just gonna let the rice continue to kind of like fluff up, but you should have no doubts that your chicken is totally cooked. And, um, and yeah, that's gonna be great. So I could even taste test my rice right now, but, and then you can kind of fluff this up together when you serve it. Might be slightly salty since that chicken stock. <laughs> Probably has a little salt in it, but that's okay. It'll still be good. Okay, so let that continue to sit for like 10 minutes just so that the rice can be totally, totally soft. And then you serve it up. And this actually holds up on the heat very well. So when it's off the heat, covered, you can let that sit for even a good 20, 
even up to, up to 30 minutes. You just don't wanna let this sit for, you don't wanna let any protein sit for any more than two hours at room temperature. That's when you can start to create bacteria. But you know, the chicken could start to dry out if you left it too long. But right now it's just kind of holding at a warm temperature. So, you know, if you were planning on eating at six o'clock and not everybody's home yet, you can really hold this. Just keep the, the lid on it. And we have another question from Kim. How can we sign up for all of your classes? Well, that's a wonderful question. Thank you so much for asking. I'm not doing any in-person classes any longer, so everything is online. Um, I've been actually teaching online for about three years. So all the classes that I was teaching in person, I also offered online. I have a, a monthly subscription service. It's very, very reasonable. And so I tape a class every month and then it goes out to my online subscribers. And then I do a uh, Facebook Live with them once a month to answer any questions that they have about it. So that's all on my website. And then I also do um, cooking boot camps. So I did four last year and they were great. So I'm going to repeat them next year. So I'm going to repeat my plant based boot camp in January. And if you subscribe to my website, which is free to subscribe, then you'll be the first to hear about it. But they, they sold out every single time. It was a very, very popular um, course. Fantastic. Thank you, Pamela. Um, so if our guest rice is a little hard, should they add more stock? Or what um, should they do? No, I think you should be okay just to let it sit for another, you know, 15 minutes or something like that. I mean, if you, here's the thing is if your water or if your stock was rapidly boiling such that, you know, you made the liquid evaporate too quickly, then you could sprinkle a little bit of water on top, but you don't need much. So just keep it covered and you know, just give it that extra 10 minutes. All right. Um, any tricks for bringing back to life completely wilted salad greens? Hmm. Um, you could rinse the, or like put, submerge them in a um, sink of very, very cold water and try that and then just spin them dry. Otherwise, I would stir them into a soup if, if you can't use them for a salad. They're totally fine in soup. In fact, in Europe, they use salad greens in soups all the time. Thank you. Um, how much dill should our guests add if they want to add it? Oh, that's a great question. I actually have some dill. And this is really just for garnish, but I love the flavor of dill with this. So we could just literally take off from the big stems. And I mean, really it's just like a handful. Like this is how much I'm gonna add like that. I love dill in this recipe. I mean, you could also do parsley. I think the herbs just give it a little bit of a pretty like punch of color, just sort of brightens it up a bit. So I'm just going to fold this dill, this fresh dill together. I happen to have it. And then just chop this up. And then when I serve it, the thing about the, the herbs, which is nice if you're just using it as garnish, is if somebody in your household doesn't like dill, then they don't have to have it. You know, you could add it to each individual portion. So somebody says here, um, she she has too much water because she, oh, she soaked her rice. Got it. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So what you're going to do is you are going to continue cooking it, but with the lid off and you should be okay. It's possible if you soaked your rice, um, it would need less time and less water, but the worst that's going to happen is that maybe your rice is a little bit um, mushy. Okay, but it's it's still going to be edible. It'll still taste good. You're just going to keep cooking it, Lisa, with the lid off. 
Thank you so much. Um, we had a question from earlier. What is your favorite cookware? Do you have a favorite brand of cookware? Yeah, I, I actually do. I use my favorite set of stainless steel skillets is by All Clad. I've been using them for 30 years. And then I love the enameled cast iron by Staub. My favorite, favorite, favorite. I, again, those are life, lifetime investment pieces. Fantastic, thank you. Um, oh, your kids love the dressing, that's so cute. Um, Ellen, you could add, it depends on how you wanna present it, Ellen, in terms of the salad. If you wanna add the apples and walnuts now and then dress the salad. I actually like adding the apples um, because in the beginning, because then they get coated in the dressing and they're less likely to oxidize, but it also depends on the presentation. So something like heavy ingredients, I find that if you have a salad and you have heavy ingredients, what can happen is you toss them and then they sink to the bottom. I really love using more shallow bowls for salads or even platters. And that way you can kind of see everything. So if you want, we can dress our salad right now and we can take our apples and walnuts. And if you want, we could do most of the apples and most of the walnuts and then just add a few on top to make sure we still see some on top. So do that. And then like that, and then let's dress. And then I'm just gonna add a little bit because these are very fine salad greens, just like that. And I'm gonna toss this with my hands really lightly. This is the way that you'll know if you need more or if you've kind of overdone it. And it keeps all of your ingredients from getting like manhandled, <laughs> right? And banged around. So this was enough dressing and now I'm done. And then we can add a few nuts on top just so that we can see some. Same thing with the apples. Another thing that you can do in general with salads is if you have an ingredient that, there, that looks so pretty. If you have an ingredient that you don't wanna to toss because it's gonna get bruised or mushed. So something that comes to mind is avocado and maybe something like feta, then leave those off. You toss your whole salad and then you can put your avocado around. You can also separate the ingredients of your salad and then just toss them in a little bit of dressing. So if you wanted to cut your apples way ahead of time and just like get that out of the way, but you don't want them to get brown, yes, you can cover them with water and then drain them and pat them dry. But also what you can do is coat them with a little bit of the dressing and then just leave them off to the side so that they don't turn brown. Kim, your veggie dish is so yummy. I'm so glad. Okay. Okay. I substituted the chickpeas for the chicken because I was so excited about that and I, I, sorry, I had to taste it and dig in and it is so good. Good, I'm glad. Yeah. Uh, somebody asked about enameled staub, like this 13 inch one, I use this all the time. This is, um, I think this is their five and a, no, four quart cocote, which is this one. They're quite heavy, just letting you know. I don't even put this one away anymore because I use it so much and it's so heavy. So I'll put this back here. So there's that. And um, how do you spell it? S T. Let's see. I think I can type in the chat. S T A U B. There we go. <laughs> and then um, how do you quickly dry lettuce? The salad spinner is really the best way if you have a salad spinner. Otherwise, you can lay it out on a dry kitchen towel, roll it up and kind of like press it a bit and it should be pretty good to go that way. You could also, if you wanted to, I mean, it sounds a little ridiculous, but take a, or a like a pillowcase and throw your lettuce in there and like kind of spin it around. That's, I know that's like kind of an old school way to do it, but it works, just saying. 
Um, do you have to season those like cast iron? No, you don't. The ones that are enameled are good to go. You can rinse them with soap and water. They are much less maintenance than traditional cast iron, but they are much more expensive. But they're easier. All right, we're coming up to six and we're so honored to have Pamela in our kitchen or my little tiny, I wouldn't call it a kitchen. I would call it a stove, but I can't tell you how much fun this has been for me. And I'm sure everyone out there from all of these questions, we're so grateful for it to you. This has been great. Uh, we do want to um, do one quick um, giveaway for one of your books because you're just so awesome and oh yeah of you will run and get these books from um pages or they'd be a great um gift for christmas i already my sister couldn't attend so i already bought one for her and sending it so she doesn't know this so this is the last question everyone get on chat here it is it's going to be a number again and i'm going to say get your fingers ready it's going to be here so first person that types in the uh number katie are you ready Quickly, how many books has Pamela Salzman published? Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, that was so fast. Katie, who's the winner? Okay, it looks like we have a winner, winner Linda Rosen. Congratulations. Oh, yay, Linda. Uh, when a signed copy of Quicker Than Quick. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we'll follow up with you, Linda, uh, to get your information to get you that book. So thank you, Pamela. Any other last words of wisdom or I'm going to toast you oh. and eat my beautiful meal tonight because it is fantastic. I cannot thank you. Well, bon appetit, everybody. It was really wonderful to spend the evening with you and see so many of you. I hope you guys had fun. I hope you enjoy your dinner. Um, and uh, this, well, you guys know where to find me, obviously, but this can will show you that, you know, even though we were talking a lot, this dish would have come together even more quickly. So <laughs> it doesn't take that much time, you know, to put a healthy uh, meal on the table for your family, get your kids involved, get them to do some of the work and they'll learn at the same time. And I hope you guys have a happy holiday. James, you want to take it away? You there, James? Whoops. Yep. Um, so uh, uh, just, I'm sure you all want to dive into your amazing meal. I'm going to speak really fast so you guys can be eating. Um, but before you go, we did want to let you know that we'll be sending an email tomorrow with a recording of tonight's event and some helpful links. Um, as Kim mentioned, we really, really, really want to thank Pamela so much for the fantastic lesson. If you'd like to join any of her cooking classes or find more tasty recipes, please head over to her website at PamelaSalzman.com. We'd also like to thank the following sponsors of the event. Uh, thanks to Paige's Bookstore. If you weren't one of the lucky winners of her books, make sure to purchase one from Paige's. They ship all over. Um, we'd like to thank Wien Green for the great glass containers in the ingredients bag. And we'd also like to thank the city of Manhattan Beach for donating the reusable bags and for supporting us for over a decade. If you'd like further, uh, if you'd like to further your support of Grades of Green, you can do so at the link on this slide. And thank you everyone. Um, and thank you for, for joining us and we hope you enjoy your meal.